Right, afternoon. Um, what I'm going to do for the next 25 minutes is just take a canter through where we're looking to take Essex over, over the next sort of three to five years. What I'm not going to be doing is concentrating on corporate IT or information governance and stuff like that. What we're looking at in Essex is to, uh, is to take a much deeper and much more holistic approach to what technology can do to actually change the way people live in the county. Um, and as I'm going through uh, some of the slides here, I'll be, I'll be picking up on some of the big pressures that we're facing over the next 15 years and what we're looking to do to actually tackle that. So hopefully there'll be some stuff here that's a bit different from the usual. Um, my remit as Exec Director for Place Operations, as well as being the CIO, also covers um, housing growth, planning, um, green assets, country parks, school crossing patrols. I I don't know where that one came from, but I've got those as well, um, and a host of other things. What's great about the role is it's given me a lot of the assets and a lot of the infrastructure of the county to work with alongside technology to do something that we hope will be uh, much more transformative um, in terms of the population and economy of the county as we go forward, especially against the backdrop of austerity um, and, and all of that, that that's sort of bringing with it um, in, the, in the world of public service. In terms of Essex, top right hand, London, keep going and you'll see this dirty great big rather attractive county called Essex. Uh, two airports, number of seaports, huge amount of logistics, vast amount of London stuff comes through Essex and, and comes in. Actually a lot of Birmingham stuff does as well. So, you know, very, very sort of significant. Area. One of the biggest concentrations of data centres in Europe as well, down in Basildon. Um, and also one of the biggest areas of pharmaceutical uh, research and development around Harlow and also around ARU um, tied up with Medtech which is a rapidly growing environment so there's a lot going on but we also have a very rich heritage um, around telecommunications, birthplace of radio and all that fun stuff but we're still three quarters of our county is countryside farming uh, which brings with it some real challenges around connectivity in terms of population, we're the second largest county uh, local authority in the country, uh, with about one and a half million residents, awful lot of land, awful lot of houses, awful lot of businesses, and a 20 billion local economy. Actually, I need to update that, that was four years ago. It's now close to 30 billion, and we're expecting that local economy in the next 10 years to go close to 55 billion. So there's rapid growth around the economic piece. And as a workforce and as a county council, um, again, fairly substantial budget, but reducing under the current environment. Um, and also a lot of schools and a very complex political environment, as well as a very po complex public sector environment. And that will play through on some of the stuff I'll be looking at around what we do about smart Essex moving forward. I did the strategy five years ago for Essex, this was it, and back then IT was a very different world. End user computing, information governance, collaboration, skills capacity and customer centric services. We've kind of been through all of those, we've now got a workforce that's 95% mobile, we've halved our estate, information governance, we're still the only public sector organisation that's got full assurance from the ICO. Um, and on collaboration, we've made some great inroads on collaboration with uh, colleagues from districts, police, struggling with health, to be fair, but we have made some great inroads with others. And on IT skills and capacity, we mainstreamed um, IT skills as core competence for our entire workforce, rather than it just being about the techies. So our view on that was, if you're going to invest in IT, make sure your workforce can use the IT. So we've spent a lot of time and effort dealing with that. And around customer-centric services, to be fair, we've had more of a mixed bag with that. We've had some considerable success around Blue Badge and some other services. We've had less success around some of our other services as a reflection of the disparate nature of public sector with two-tier government and also the other public agencies. So we're going to have another good go at that to do something about it more fundamentally. So what's Smart Essex? Five fields we're looking at at the same time. Uh, smart movement, streamlined public service, smart places, sustainable energy, and ultra-fast and super-fast connectivity. And within that, skill set. So I'm going to pick, go through each of those as we go through and sort of break them out a little bit more. But for us, we think they are the five components with five discrete technology arenas that we must glue together 
to really do something different and to truly capitalise on what technology can do for us and our residents, and also to cater for, again, the reality of growth in our county. Being a neighbour of London, we are expecting our population to go from 1.5 to 1.9 million over the next 15 years, and our housing demand, an increase of 130,000 houses in that geography. So some big numbers to play with. I also have housing growth strategy as part of my remit, so that does keep me up at night, trying to work out where we're going to put them all. Around smart movement, we chose those two words carefully. We didn't say smart transport, we certainly didn't say autonomous transport. When we looked at this, we thought long and hard about the fact this is not just about people and it's not just about freight. It's about people, freight and data. And for us, it's about the fact that hard infrastructure is a really difficult thing to expand. It's difficult to build new roads, it's difficult to widen them, it's really hard to expand a rail network. But we are going to have more stuff more people going in, around, in and out and around our county. How are we going to deal with it? So our thinking around smart movement is actually thinking about how you can use technology to bring those things together to smooth the flow over 24 hours, over seven days a week. So our thinking around technology and smart movement is how we can actually bring that lot together to actually help deal with that increased demand without exacerbating situation around congestion. And that asks some very difficult questions around logistics, freight, public transport and, of course, individual choice on how people use personal transport and cycling and all that other stuff that kind of comes into it. Yeah? Our start point on this, though, is, is back to that point. It takes a long time to widen a road or build a new one. The population is going to grow faster than we can do that. So what can we do to actually help make that easier in between? whilst we deal with longer-term infrastructure demands. So looking at what people need to move, things and people, how, road, rail, air, sea, networks, and the when. And for us, changing workshopping and learning patterns and methods are crucial to actually taking advantage of this. We've already seen a massive change in commuting habits during the week. You drive around the roads on a Friday in Essex, it's a lot easier than Monday to Thursday because a significant proportion of the working population works from home on a Friday. Fantastic. How can we get that to smooth out over the week, maybe? Yeah? Also, the roads are empty at 3 o'clock in the morning, but they're jammed at 9 o'clock in the morning with HGVs. Why? Why can't they go earlier? Why can't they use the roads when they're less busy? What about rail? An awful lot of freight can go on rail, takes roads, you know, lorries off the road. It's that kind of thinking that we're looking at. And the data piece ties up very much with home working. Home working will take off if people have access to good quality, reliable broadband. So our investment on the Superfast program, and I'll get onto that on the other work stream, is crucial for this smart movement piece. We'd like to see people only commuting three days a week, not four. It takes more pressure off, and it's doable. Yeah? What we're also seeing uh, around that piece, around the data piece, is how we can actually then ensure ultra-fast connectivity is available in the parts of the county where we've got massive growth in two big industries that are very, very data-hungry, manufacturing through 3D printing and advanced and predictive analytics through the Knowledge Gateway at Essex University, what ARU is doing and what we, and what we have in terms of some very... Uh, sophisticated, small, but very data-hungry uh, economics companies yeah, who work closely with the city. So there's some stuff to play through on that. Polycentric geography, blessing and a curse. One thing we love about Essex is we don't, we're not dominated by big urban sprawls. Um, our population is spread out in a lot of small towns. We like that and actually more by accident than design it's enabled us to sustain our green mix with our suburban and urban environments to make them more attractive. It's a real selling point for a lot of people that live there and they want that to stay. So what we need to do through smart movement is do it in a way that we don't end up losing that nice balance. Yeah? And it also plays in with our schools as well. Okay? 
The one thing we are mindful of, though, around this smart movement piece, because it will bring more autonomous activity in, is the security piece. And we've all seen the horror stories of hacked autonomous cars and all that kind of stuff. So again, front and centre of our thinking on this is how we work with industry to ensure that we don't create disasters of the future by being overly reliant on autonomous activity without having the requisite security arrangements in place. Yeah? We can influence planning but we need to move into influencing movement more. Through planning legislation, we can do some good stuff, but actually we need to start influencing logistics companies, bus companies, and actually populations around changing their travel habits. So that's smart movement for us. Public services, a couple of things going on. Data and access, um, the stuff that's on here isn't really new, but I think the, uh, you know, and sometimes we need to remind ourselves, we've been doing quite a lot of this stuff for a while, we just need to move it on to the next level. So using data, accessing data, recognising you know, we don't own it and never have and being custodians. For us, the, the base point for us in public sector multi-agency working is getting your position right on your responsibilities around our residents' information and how we use it to better inform and deliver public service going forward. Yeah? One of my big sticking points on this is we still end up being driven by the lowest common denominator, the least confident, least sophisticated, least information advanced public sector organisation slows everybody else down, purely by fact that they will not sign information sharing protocols because they're frightened. And so what we find too often when you get into more complex multi-agency public service arrangements, you could have five agencies mad keen to collaborate, work together and do something dramatically different, and then agency number six says no. And without all six, it won't work. So that's a real challenge on how we can lift, generally, public sector confidence and awareness around legislative responsibilities, around information sharing, to kind of kick through that and come out the other side. Our approach, we're very much driven by citizen-centric predictive analytics and GIS. I think ge geospatial representations of information is still woefully underused in many, many sectors, especially in the public sector. The visualisation of information around geography really helps make very different decisions, and I've got a couple of examples I'll show you. What it isn't about is mega warehouses of data. And that's part of the, the challenge that we get into with people. They, cut, they keep thinking, all this stuff needs to be in one place. No, you can, you can do what you need to do in distributed networks quite easily. So some of the examples of what we're doing. Um, unemployment impact on health and well-being, something we did a couple of years ago, this actually. We took a load of composite data, and what this told us was basically how to better target our public health funding. We were able to halve our public health budget, but increase by the order of 20% our success rate on public health campaigns around reducing smoking, obesity and teenage pregnancy because we knew where to target the resources and knew where to put the investment in rather than scattergunning the county. Yeah. This one's what we use around schools. What we have now is we have very, very good predictive analytics around where we need to put basic need in primary, secondary schools. And as a result, Essex gets a 95% hit rate on people getting the school of first or second choice. Yeah? But that's by thinking through what's going to happen over your population over the next five years rather than retrospectively building. Yeah? That's getting harder, though, because the population is getting more mobile. Yeah? JWIC. Some people might have seen the series, some people might have heard about it. Our deprived area in Essex, um, which was a shock to many, um, not least to me. I was in central government when JWIC was discovered as part of the Neighbourhood Renewal Programme. A little housing estate, uh, Brooklyn's estate, which used to be a holiday camp in 1953. Um, JWIC was flooded, large flood, a number of people were killed, a number of the survivors moved from where they'd been flooded into this holiday camp and stayed there and nobody noticed until 1998 when we did the Neighbourhood Renewal Programme and identified a population of around 6,000 people with some of the highest teenage pregnancy rates, highest drug abuse rates, highest single parent incidents and lowest employment in the country. I think it's still the third lowest or third um, most deprived ward in the entire UK. What we're doing now um, is we're actually looking at composite data sets 
to help us make better decisions about how we can change the lives of those people going forward. Historically, to be fair, what we did was we fixed bits. So we chucked in an intervention around training, didn't work. Did an intervention around improving some of the infrastructure, didn't work. Individual things don't work. When you've got something that is completely as broken as that is, you need to take a much more holistic approach. So what we're doing now through public service and technology-enabled public service is looking to pull those information assets together to help us make decisions about how we can do combined interventions around improving housing and roads and creating jobs and doing training and doing better health provision and making them more mobile. And most importantly, Importantly of all, getting the kids to stop looking down and start looking up, build aspiration. That's where our thinking is in this kind of stuff. The other example we've used here, this is a map we, uh, on the Superfast Broadband Programme. Um, while we're investing all these loads of money for the population, the thought we had was um, as we move the entire workforce to mobile working, uh, recognising our rurality, um, there's not a lot of point in moving staff to mobile working if they haven't got the broadband to work from home. Yeah? So what we did was we mapped the entire pop, uh, working workforce of the county uh, against the Superfast Broadband Programme and then we aligned our building consolidation and disposal programme to our rollout. So that what we did as we went through and did the Superfast rollout, we also did the move to mobile working so that staff were able to make that transition as a result we had very, very positive feedback from the staff, very little grief over what can be a quite challenging and difficult thing to do, but we got the balance right about staff appreciating the work-life balance change and us being able to bank £54 million worth of capital receipts. So it's a big, big change for the county. So where next for us on Streamline Public Services? We want to move towards public access to services beyond web libraries. We're looking at can we go into ubiquitous public service offices? Does it matter what public agency you work from? It shouldn't do. The network connectivity should just work for you. Co-location is the first step to collaboration and then, in, in effect, consolidation in public service. But you've got to do the first bit to get the others to fly. Around the transparency piece, we put a lot of effort into transparency because what we also recognise, going down this path, you've got to sustain trust from your population that you're doing the right thing. Yeah? Analytics capability, I've given you some examples. For me, they're the tip of the iceberg. I think we can do some fantastic things around that kind of composite data analysis, advanced analytics and predictive analytics to win the very difficult arguments we're going to have around where we're going to put that housing and what difference it will make to those communities. From it being a not in my backyard to actually I can see the value of this for where I live and how I live. Yeah? People operating across organisations and role-based access is quite clearly important around that. And tech infrastructure is an integral part of local development planning, which I'll get onto on the smart places bit in a minute. But never lose sight of skills and education. One thing that's been a hot topic for us is what we can do around skills and continuous professional development to help our businesses keep pace with change. Um, adult community learning is, is part of my remit as well. And we're very, very focused on STEM and construction and community health. There's three core markets where we need to up our game and really you know, keep pace with the demand that's out there with our population. And knowledge gateways, you know, crossroads for analytics, inform outcome-based decision-making is absolutely where we need to get to. So on smart places, I've mentioned a couple of times, I've got a few houses to build. It's not just about the volume, though, it's also about the type. Our demographic is changing massively. We're getting a huge peak in over 65, so over the next five to seven years. Inevitably, that's going to tail off again. So not only are we having to deal with a peak over the next 15 years, we're also having to plan for a significant change again in housing need as the inevitability of mortality happens. Yeah, so we've got to kind of work that through. Um, what we also have um, tied into that is an increased need in independent living and learning development independent living. Part of what we're looking to do is create more housing units that can enable people to stay at home longer and not go into residential care. Two reasons, their self-respect and it's cheaper and the two match. Quite straightforward, yeah? Our mix of rural, suburban, urban landscape is unusual. We absolutely want to, and 
believe me, this is a political one with 10 foot high letters. You know, the countryside needs to stay. It needs to be worked in and we need to get that balance right. And as an authority, we need to be self-sustaining financially. The Smart Places piece it's also a key driver on how we get our balance of tax receipts right in the absence of central government funding. So a key part of what I look at here is what's the mix on council tax banding? Yeah? What is the potential on business rates or whatever the successor business you know, financial model is going to be? What kind of infrastructure are we going to need to make the best of that so that we're able to support the public services that we need in the county? So, smart places sustain our assets, absorb demand, meet the challenge of change. And, you know, it's, it's complex, it's interesting, intellectually, it's fascinating. But what we're looking at are garden settlements, looking at growing businesses, we're looking at sustaining green assets. And also, really interestingly, looking at heritage, culture and arts and what we do to sustain and grow that because it's really valuable in terms of people's quality of life. And it's a draw for people to want to live there. So, whilst it's not all about technology, it does have a central role to play in all of those things. Through independent living, crime reduction movement, education, retail, all changing seismically, all being driven by technological change. We want to embrace it and drive it through. Often forgotten this one, sustainable energy. Um, the other thing about this population, we're operating at about 85-90% of our capacity of energy access at the moment in the county, and yet we're looking at a population that goes 10% above that 100%. What are we going to do that's different? So we're looking at there what we can do around reducing consumption, renewable. One that's really interesting to me at the moment is what they've done in Scandinavia, where they're building small-scale development with storage off renewable within that community because you lose a lot of renewable energy through its transportation. If you can keep it local, you can dramatically incre increase the, uh, the, the sort of energy that you've got there for use. So new home design and equipment management is going to think, help with us all this. And again, the flexible working piece takes a load of energy consumption out from commuting. Yeah? And the one that I think is often overlooked is the new shopping patterns and the, you know, the internet type shopping stuff. To what extent can that actually be an advantage or a disadvantage around energy consumption depending how well it's handled, which ties you back into local logistics. Yeah? Sounds fascinating in there. Last but not least, ultra-fast, super-fast and skills. Now, we deliberately put the three of these together. They don't, on the face of it, seem to make much sense. The ultra-fast and super-fast piece is clearly about the infrastructure, making sure that we've got a completely connected county. We tackle that countryside piece, brilliant, and all the rest of it. That's super-fast. Ultra-fast for us is our businesses are already maxing out on super-fast capability. We recognise we need gigabit speeds minimum on our industrial parks for our businesses to continue to grow. So that's where we're targeting our next phase there. But underpinning that is great if you provide them with connectivity, but if they still haven't got a skilled workforce, those businesses will move. Yeah? So in you know, twin tracking this, we're putting a lot of effort onto the skills piece to ensure that we start sustaining and growing a workforce you know, that, can, that can kind of keep pace with what those businesses are looking for. And actually change as well. Yeah? Well, how long is it going to be before the construction industry becomes less reliant on traditional build and more reliant on 3D printing around prefabricated housing? That's the kind of seismic change we're going to see in that market. So, those five themes, what we're looking for, we want to get to the front in terms of councils. We want to embrace technology and we want to do what it says on the tin there. Hopefully that gave you some food for thought. Happy to take questions. Thank you. How do you influence the kind of changes you need, particularly around things like super fast broadband, yeah. skills generation, hmm. when actually you have no direct control over them as a county council? We do want Superfast on a number of levels. Um, the Superfast Essex programme is a £54 million programme. £12 million of that money unlocked the other £40 million. So our direct influence was if we didn't stick the £12 million in, the other £40 wouldn't have happened. Yeah? The other way we influence that one directly is through planning. Um, so what we can do through planning legislation, and it's kicking in later this year I think, um, is we can mandate new developments over a certain number of houses have to either provision super fast as standard or put a financial contribution in to ensure that a broadband provider does it in their place. So we can do that kind of direct influence. 
The skills and training piece, again, we, we do have a lot of influence over. Um, we have um, this skills funding agency grant that's, that's rooted through my teams. I have 12 ACL colleges um, and 500 people you know, training across adult community learning. And we have a strategic alliance with all of the FE colleges in the county and also with the two universities. So what we do is we use those kind of networks to steer that what we also use is capital investment, so we directly invest in some of the STEM um, developments. We've done it for three, one in Basildon, one in Harlow, and one in Braintree, to actually create that capacity. Yeah. It gets interesting, <laughs> as you can imagine. Yeah. Cool. Um, did you be able to share this with the other countries? Sorry, yeah. I mean, the lesson learned and best practices. Other countries, if necessary. Yes, I'm. Uh, yeah, happy to. I'm doing it. I'm flying out to China in September to do similar because they've got, funnily enough, similar issues to us. One of the big challenges that you know, where's this population coming from, right? Um, for us, and what it is, of course, is you've got London, and then you've got us really is the countryside around it and what's happening of course is as London grows people are moving out as people are moving out they, they're creating the housing demand um, and, and China's having that same issue now with some of its new urban cities you know some of its new digital cities so they're very keen to see what we're doing around that the other issue China's got and it's going a hell of a lot faster than ours is aging population because of course they had decades of one child families and they've got a time bomb that makes ours look like a walk in the park so they're fascinated with what we're doing around um, independent living and older people. Especially with the UN, HHS and WHO may be too much interested. Yeah, cool. On, on, on the topic of uh, speed of IT, on the topic of sp speed of IT, um, I, I think a couple of years back, like three years back, Cabinet Office came, came up with this whole agile, you know, smaller is better and beautiful kind of initiative, right? And, and linking that with the whole Gartner language which came out last year for bimodal IT. So if I put the two together, mm. it's kind of fascinating options for us, isn't it? I mean, we can then have IT moving at two different paces, which kind of works also to the cabinet agenda strategy. So it's, it's a big take. I'm just wondering what's your view uh, and what's your experience of doing that? I mean, have uh, the county adopted some of that? What's the collaboration between cabinet office and the county? I mean, what, what, what's, what's your experience? Yeah, we're good with it. I mean, I'm doing... Um yeah, to be brutally honest, the GDS type stuff hasn't really impacted on us. I'm cool with that and they'll do their thing and whatever. Um, I think the, the best thing they've come up with, frankly, is the verify thing. And I've said to my guys, don't invent another one. There's one there and it works. Please use it. Yeah. I think, um, I think there is... The central local government relationship is a complex one, let's be honest. Uh, and I think the devolution debate has complicated that further. Uh, we have a little vote going on today, of course, which is complicating things too. Um, and I think there are some behaviours on some of the Whitehall departments and central local government relationship which are still challenging. And the two standouts for me, it's not actually the Cabinet Office, I think they're pretty much on board and good. It's DOH and DWP. And how do we get to a different kind of relationship with those guys? Because they're both still very centralist. Uh, and I think there is still a relatively low level of trust between central and local. We need to break that because that's two thirds of the taxpayer spend going through those two. Just, just a question, if I may, just mm -hmm. to piggyback on that. I mean, in some of the areas, clearly, you, you, your thinking is quite advanced, and you know, some of some of the fresh thinking in there, which which I can see, in, at least in some areas. Mm. Have you thought about, uh, for lack of a better term, reusing or reselling your services to probably some other counties or some other cabinet offices? Yeah. Because it, it might be really interesting. Funny you should mention that. Another bit of my interesting portfolio is uh, traded services. So yeah. <laughs> And, but what we want to do is make sure we, we, we productize it. Um, we, we have, at the moment in Essex, we have about uh, five different trading services at the moment that, that have about 90, not between 90 and 100 million pound a year turnover, um, which successfully sell not just uh, to other local authorities, but actually to, to other organizations. And it's something, again, that we're very keen to continue to develop and exploit. So again, it's all part of this autonomous, sustainable funding piece. And there are kind of three planks, well, four planks to it. One is around capital investment to get revenue return. One is around what you've described there, the traded services and what we can do to, to maximise that benefit. And the other two are the ones I mentioned around council tax and business rate. Yeah? And those four um, were working together on to get us a position of no 
uh, no reliance on central government grant by 2020. Hmm. Okay, well, thanks very much indeed, uh, David, for, uh, I think that's a very inspiring talk. Thank you Good. very much indeed. And Thank I you. Hope you Cheers. Thank you.